as you may have noticed, we sometimes like to start our early mornings, I know you're all probably a little sleepy, with something extremely important and interesting. And uh, this morning is absolutely no exception. Um, it's my great honor this morning to be joined by General Philip Breedlove. He is the former Supreme Allied Commander for NATO in Europe. Uh, obviously, he has a large breadth of experience uh, that pertains to the defense of Ukraine and um, all of the potential geopolitical implications of the war in Ukraine. Uh, he also has I don't know how many flying hours in an F-16, which I think may come, come up today. And uh, we are also joined by Yegor Dubinsky, who is the Deputy Minister for Cybersecurity uh, in Ukraine at the Ministry of Digital Transformation. Uh, I think we'll get into this pretty shortly, but um, I couldn't think of a better person to be discussing this conflict with, given the uh, deeply technical aspects of the war um, and the role that modern technology has played in the conflict on the front line and in cyber, et cetera. So um, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your time. I know you're both very busy, and you both have very important things to do, so it's, it's a deep honor to have you with us. Um, yeah. With, with that, uh, General Breedlove, I'd like to start with you. I'll try to go quickly here because we have limited time and so many things to discuss. Um, first off, I think a lot of people have seen many statements from the Russian government uh, regarding the expansion of NATO being the cause of the conflict. Uh, as we all know or should know, um, the, the conflict actually has been ongoing for a long time, um, but the kind of re-invasion, the more massive invasion, um, that, was, that was often described as the effective uh, cause. Uh, you're a NATO guy, so can you tell us a little bit about your perspective on that concept? Well, first of all, thanks for having me here, and it's, it's great to be on with Yegor, and, and, uh, and I look forward to our conversation. Uh, nothing could be farther from the truth. This has been the standard mantra of Russia for literally the last 20 years. Everything they don't like, they blame on the growth of NATO. Having sat in on many meetings at the, at the level of heads of state even, where how or when NATO should grow and listening to those conversations, uh, let me assure you that NATO was not out there ever clawing to get more people in NATO. Rather, it was the other way around. Nations, some of them who had uh, won their independence twice from Russia or the Soviet Union were clawing to get in. And so it's a misnomer that NATO's out trying to find its way closer uh, to Russia. It's not. And I would also just say, listen, before this war started, there were three documents that are pretty easy to Google and read. The sort of 5,000 word document where Mr. Putin said, there is no Ukraine. It is the Ukraine and it is a part of Russia. And you remember the whole diatribe. He laid out what he thought of Ukraine. And then the two documents that they gave us about eight days before the war started and said, sign these documents or there will be other means, which we now understand what that meant. And if you read those documents, Mr. Putin laid out in very straightforward terms his understanding of how the security architecture of Eastern Europe should be set up and that he was going to set about doing that. So I'll close this question with just saying, this war is completely contrived. It is completely at the behest of Mr. Putin. This is about Mr. Putin and his worldview. It has nothing to do with NATO growing closer to Russia. I think it's kind of interesting too, as a follow on, um, a number of countries have now uh, either expressed interest or begun to join NATO, it being a defensive treaty, uh, likely because there is an aggressive neighbor who's been invading its neighbors. Um, can you talk a little bit, uh, just briefly too, because we have so much to get into, but about what you see as the future of NATO? I think it would be interesting to know um, how quickly do you think uh, other countries will join? There's a few, but Sweden is one of them and Ukraine would be the other. So I uh, got to speak multiple times at the 70th anniversary of NATO. That's now 
past for a few years. But what I said then I think is even more important now. I would tell you that NATO is going to be more important in the next 70 years than it has been in the last 70 years. And so the vitality and the energy that we need to put into NATO is going to be more and more important. Of course, we've welcomed Finland, and they were immediately a contributing member of NATO. We hope to very, very soon bring aboard Sweden. They also have exercised and worked with us for so long. They will be immediate contributors to NATO security. And um, I, it's no secret, it's out there all the time, believe that Ukraine deserves a right to come into uh, the alliance. I, I often say I can't judge the uh, political aspects, although I have an opinion, and that is that they have met those aspects. But I can absolutely tell you in a military sense that Ukraine uh, is ready. And they are working every day to be more and more interoperable with Western way of war. And frankly, they're teaching us some things we need to learn about Western war. That actually is a perfect lead in to what I was hoping we could cover next, which is that there's been a, um, an offensive going throughout the summer. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, pieces in media calling it a failure. I think it's a lot harder to judge than it looks in a few news articles I've seen, and I think you could probably offer a lot of perspective about that, but can you describe a little bit why it's been difficult to advance for Ukrainian forces, what's going on at the front lines, what's happening now, and where we see that going? Do you think, um, you know, what timeline do you think the offensive will move on, will it halt, et cetera? Well, let me, let me clear up something you said. I do not, I absolutely do not see this offensive as failing. I think there are a lot of people out there that do not understand maneuver warfare. And they had this view of uh, when the Ukrainians launched their offensive, it was going to be rapiers in the sky and flags in the breeze, and off we go like the charge of the light brigade. What that demonstrates is a complete and utter lack of understanding of maneuver warfare. Additionally, um, we, we have talked about how we do maneuver warfare. In the West, the very first requirement to execute maneuver warfare is to have battlefield air superiority over your troops. Have we provided the means for Ukraine to have battlefield air superiority over their troops? No, not even close. And in fact, Russia hasn't done a good job of trying to establish battlefield air superiority because Ukraine has given them fits with their uh, land-based defense systems. So the idea of, uh, of an offensive executed without battlefield air superiority would stymie a lot of Western war makers because, or war planners, because we would never, let me say that one more time, we would never plan to do that without that capability. And I would also say um, uh, I have, many peers that are still doing this business. One of my former peers is now the Secretary of Defense. And when he was the commander of CENTCOM, if you had told him he was going to fight a war without his long range precise artillery, uh, it would have been very ugly in the room when that decision was made. We have not, I'll say it one more time, we have not given Ukraine yet what they need to fight a modern maneuver warfare offensive in Ukraine. And I believe we need to rectify that series of decisions. How do you see that um, playing out? I mean, I, th I think I've seen the same thing you're describing. Uh, it, it seems uh, very slow walked at times, uh, the way that things are kind of drip fed to the Ukrainian military. Um, do you think, why do you think that's happening? And um, do you think it will change and when? Not my words, but I've adopted them because I love it. We have had an approach which many now are calling creeping incrementalism. Everything we do, we do in this slow, ponderous approach. And, uh, and I think it's primarily because in the end game, we are deterred. We told the enemy at the beginning of the war what we were afraid of. 
We said we, we're not going to put any boots on the ground. We don't want this war to widen, and we uh, want to avoid nuclear exchange. Those are all noble things. I'm not criticizing those. I don't think I would have transmitted those to my enemy before the war started. And so what does the enemy play back to us almost on a daily basis? At some senior level, someone is talking about something that makes nukes more threatening. The latest iteration is they're dropping out of the test ban treaty. But almost weekly, we have these pronunciations about this is going to end up in a nuclear place or we're getting closer to nukes. So they play back our fear to us. And then on a little less frequent basis, but still very frequently, they play back to us that this is going to widen the war. The war is definitely going to widen. And about a half the time they mention that, they add the little caveat of, and of course, once again, American soldiers are going to die on the battlefield. So the enemy has played our fears back to us. I believe we are very much deterred. And we, we make every move that we make in this slow, creeping, incrementalist way. The latest, I'll shut up now, but the latest example, we've been trying to get ATACMs to Ukraine for a long time. Um, over a year, we've been talking specifically about ATACMs. So we did give them ATACMs. We gave them the oldest, shortest range, and least capable warhead version of the ATACMs. The Ukrainians, because they are incredibly adept and very technically savvy people, have learned how to use those cluster warheads well. But to hold Crimea at risk, the entire Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea, to hold it at risk, what the Ukrainians need is the unitary warhead high explosive. It flies farther. It can kill harder targets. And if you begin to pervasively, persistently, and precisely strike the entire peninsula of Crimea, we will change the face of this war. To do that, they need the longer range ATACMs, not the shorter range ATACMs. And they need the high explosive unitary warhead version of the ATACMs, as well as the one that we've already given them, the cluster bomb one. So another sort of creeping forward as opposed to really moving to what we should have done as far as providing the Ukrainians what they need to win rather than simply survive. I think uh, another interesting thing that, that has kind of emerged from this conflict is the weakness of Russian forces. Um, they're general kind of inability to launch a capable offensive. I mean, that was very obvious early in the conflict. Um, you know, the whole Kiev in three days idea certainly fell apart quickly. Um, but now they're in a longer term conflict. And I think I'm very curious to know more about your assessment of their ability to continue fighting on the Russian side and their ability to draft more soldiers and produce more tanks, et cetera. Where do you think they stand? How long are they able to go on like this? Well, in our war colleges, and I will really badly paraphrase the statement, but in our war colleges, what we often say, and I'm an operator, I'm an F-16 driver, as you said, but in our war colleges, we say that operations and tactics are for, for the less capable, or some even use more incendiary words, you know, that the, the amateurs plan that, and that professionals plan logistics. So the, the point is that Russia started this war in a bad place because of assumptions like it's going to be a three or four day war, but also because they don't really think about log expeditionary logistics like we in the West have had to when we went to wars in Iraq and went to wars in Afghanistan and other ways. We seriously work on expeditionary logistics, and I think that Russia has ill-served or not well-served its military because its logistics planning are not good. But to your latter point, we have to be academically honest and recognize that um, Russia has more men and women, too, but more 
fighting age men than Ukraine does by far. And Russia still has a uh, lots of stocks, mostly of older equipment, but there's a lot of it there. And so we cannot uh, dismiss the staying power of Russia at this, what I would call very low technical level of war. And our, our guests will, I think, help us think through that. But at, at this sort of attritional, grinding, low technic war, Russia can outlast Ukraine. And so we in the West, we have to make some tough decisions and make sure that Ukraine has the wherewithal uh, to stand and fight for as long as it takes. I think that's a perfect lead in to your profession, Yegor. Um, so I, I can't think of a better way to, to move into a discussion about this, but I think one of the most fascinating aspects of this entire conflict has been the Ukrainian military's almost wild ability to innovate. And can you kind of speak to that for a moment? I mean, this has become a conflict. Yes, it does. It is reminiscent of you know classic trench warfare from a hundred years ago. But at the same time, Ukrainian forces are jerry-rigging drone warfare techniques that are completely novel. So can you talk about kind of how that works um, in terms of your understanding of modern warfare and the implications of new technologies? What's what's the most important and most useful tech that you have seen? Um, what's needed? And uh, where do we go from here on, on adding new tech that, that helps Ukrainian forces move forward? Yeah, hello, Evan, and thank you for having me here as well. Uh, let me clarify, I'm in charge um, as Deputy Minister, I'm in charge not only cybersecurity, but also robotics and digital technologies for security and defense. And uh, General Bridlov, thank you very much for your insight and for your analysis. Yes, it's true. It's true, but I want to add a few words. Really, we believe that uh, this, this is the first uh, digital war in all dimensions. And actually, you know, we have this war it started on the ground as a ground war, but in reality, it started even before. It started from the first cyber attacks Russia caused and, uh, since January. It's the uh, attacks we uh, already detected and uh, we can prove that they are uh, Russian. In February, they have uh, committed the biggest DDoS attack on our uh, infrastructure. In middle of February, before the uh, February 24th. So in the cyberspace, the war started even before the ground. But after that, on the ground, in the air, on the sea, but we have this war also in digital space. So it's a very heavy electromagnetic warfare. It's a uh, warfare in cyber, it's warfare in media. And so where we were more capable of probably to use some digital technologies in this war. So we uh, use th this warfare mark that this is a more technological war. And uh, we see that uh, Russians with their, uh, let's say, obsolete technique, they were not capable, not only with technique, but with their uh, strategy and with their chain of command. We have deliberately or not deliberately, you know, we, we had more uh, net-centric warfare. Our troops were communicated on the horizontal level, specifically on the first days uh, of the war. And uh, it was mostly communication uh, means and they uh, use uh, very actively some technologies they had. We also were, we, we were not uh, ready for the full scale invasion from the point of view of uh, modern military, military equipment. Later, and uh, much later, you know, in a few weeks, in a few weeks, our Western allies started to supply us with some modern uh, military equipment. And we naturally, we tried to use all technologies we had at that time, you know, mostly civilian. If we had uh, civilian drones, we used civilian drones for ISR, for intelligence, uh, surveillance, reconnaissance. If we had uh, some um, Communication equipment, we use them and replace by the equipment, some military grade equipment. Uh, we were lucky that we enjoyed 
very massive and very important support of uh, our big tech partners, technological companies. So we receive Starlinks from SpaceX. We receive a lot of uh, support in uh, cyber dimension, you know, where big tech companies help us, Microsoft, uh, Google, Mandian, many other, they help us to protect our cyber assets. Uh, we enjoyed help in media space as well, because of uh, many of outlets, they recognize this is warfare also in media space, and they have to, to, to help us to uh, to show what's going on in Ukraine, you know, to show truth. But also we were doing, you know, we were learning our lessons and we were developing our own uh, equipment strategy. So uh, particularly we found that drones are very effective. Drones can help us to save our lives and uh, lives of our soldiers. And I, I, I do agree 100% with General Breedlove, you know, we have less people than Russia, but it doesn't mean that, you know, we surrender to, to, to Russia. So we can use drones and to, to, to save our people. And we start this uh, initiative, which was called Army of Drones. Uh, and we, we started to, to build and to use these drones on the front line very massively. And uh, we practically establish an uh, UAV industry in Ukraine from that. You know, a year ago when we started, not a year ago, in the, uh, July last year, when we started Army of Drones, it was an initiative of uh, President of Ukraine, General Staff, Minister of Defense, and Minister of Digital Transformation actually, you know, was in charge. And uh, we had only, you know, six producers with seven models on our market. Right now we have more than 200 companies and we have uh, contracts with 62 companies. And we bought more than one, $1 billion dollars. We bought different uh, drones from different producers. But also, you know, we were using some technologies in the uh, cyber media uh, space. You know, we are using AI particularly very actively for for uh, after targeting, for, for uh, visual navigation, for example. You know, for face recognition, particularly. You know, we use facial recognition to to for, uh, recognize uh, Russian invaders. We we believe they are war criminals, and we have uh, even special initiative to make a book of this uh, war criminals and to, bro to bring them to the court after the war. Who will survive exactly? You know, and for that we use some AI technologies. Uh, for, uh, we, we use uh, such programs like Clearview, for example, to recognize Russian murderers who, who um, simply, you know, send uh, their, our, for many of our uh, Marcus who uh, stolen uh, our property and sent to Russia through Belarus, for example. Also, you know, we used a lot of AI for recognition of their military technique. We use sensors, so we built our ISR uh, system and actually, you know, C4 ISR system for our own. We have our domestic system like Delta. Uh, we have our uh, system for artillery, for example, Kapiwa. We have a specific system for our drones. We have specific specific system for electromagnetic warfare. But we also cooperate with worldwide, uh, you know, with widely recognized companies like Palantir, and we use uh, their software as well for for, for some uh, purposes. So we integrate this uh, system. So you have uh, this war, unfortunately, generates more data than any other conflict in the uh, human history and so you need some capacity you need some specific software which is capable to for uh, to process this uh, information so we uh, use clouds for that and we are very actively right now use cloud technologies uh, and we use some specific uh, software we very actively use OSINT technologies you know, to find Russian soldiers to, to identify, right. which we believe is uh, very important. So, and in general, for right now, we believe that uh, 
we are building the system of sensor fusion where we have uh, everything starting from satellite images. By the way, we also very actively work on processing these images. We have drone uh, reconnaissance and uh, we have uh, sensors on the ground. We even, you know, establish a special software, uh, not software, a special application, which is called EVORAG, which means uh, like e-enemy. Uh, which allow people to download pictures and videos uh, and evidences of uh, Russian troops on the ground. And we have a uh, system which can process, analyze and give this data to our uh, agencies and to the, uh, our armed forces as uh, for, for, for targeting, for example. Also, you know, using uh, normative communication means like, you know, Starlink uh, and uh, when the Russians, uh, they are invade our territory, when they occupy our territory, what they are doing the first was, was what they did, you know, they cut it all uh, fiber optics and they blown up uh, our cell towers. Specifically, you know, to cut uh, uh, the population on their occupied territory, from, right. Uh, brain in the world information space. So they are, they are trying to put them behind this iron curtain, information iron curtain Russia uh, has right now. And also they destroyed around, you know, 25, more than 30% of our telecommunication infrastructure. And we were able to replace them by another set of communication goods. So what does it mean in the end? You know, it's uh, more and more we see that new technologies, they play uh, importantly, I would say, critical role in the modern warfare. Even if these technologies are not military grade, maybe not yet, recognize the military grade. We are testing them on the ground and we are using them quite effectively in the modern software warfare. So it's more innovative uh, way how to use and how to fight on the battlefield. Yeah, and I, I think we're gonna move to Q&A because we only have a couple of minutes left. So if anyone has questions, please step up to the mics. We've already got some folks, but it sounds like, I, I, I wish I had you for two hours, Yegor because it sounds like there are 50,000 things that you're doing on 50,000 fronts, right? From the information space, all these different hybrid warfare problems that you're encountering from telecoms to drone warfare to cyber. Um, so, so thank you, that's, I mean, that's all fascinating and the OSINT stuff is very interesting to me. Uh, first question over here. Yeah, Igor, um, uh, I was in Kyiv and Lviv this, uh, in July, and first a comment, then a question, and my clear impression was that Ukraine could not be more united. Old, poor, urban, rural, uh, young, old, uh, everybody seems com completely united, uh, albeit a bit exhausted. Uh, Slava Ukraini. Um, question. Slava. <laughs> what, uh, what is your top priority, uh, what's your top need in terms of electronic warfare uh, from the West, from the United States? <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, uh, Chatham House uh, rules. Yeah. So electronic warfare is quite not, severe. Uh, front not on right this, there. by the way, this is a recorded session. <laughs> to overcome Russians, you know, in electronic, uh, electromagnetic warfare, what do we need? Uh, need? We need uh, the more powerful electron, uh, electromagnetic warfare means as well. You know, to block Russian uh, Russian drones, specifically, you know, Landsat, uh, because of they are very harmful for our uh, for, for, for our soldiers on the front line. What do we need from other side? We need CRP antennas. You need more resistible uh, communication means because of many, many of them. Unfortunately, uh, you know, many of products we receive from the United States, they have to be improved before they will be sent to the front line. They were prepared for completely different warfare and they are not capable to, 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 to fight on the front line uh, in our circumstances uh, right now. So communication means uh, that um, uh, everything has to be ready to operate in the GNSS denial conditions. So, and we need optical navigation to, to replace it. And uh, probably, you know, we need more and more components 
more sophisticated because of uh, this warfare shows that the progress is uh, very fast. Just literally today I talked to the head of our uh, UAV forces and he told that, you know, we cannot set uh, technical requirements for six months. Even three months is too much. Maybe two months we will replace our requirements. So more and more it's an uh, engine of the progress. Uh, we need more components and we believe that together we can use your technologies and our uh, capabilities to produce the uh, train and to make really uh, good samples of uh, weapon we can use in the modern warfare. And I'm, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, but gentlemen, thank you, Yegor. Um, thank you, gentlemen. I know you're very busy. I know there's a lot going on in your worlds, and it means a lot to us that you've come to join us this morning, and uh, hopefully more in the future. Thank you. Thank you.